Coming up next, we bring you a hearing conducted by a House Science, Space, and Technology subcommittee. Members of the Environment Panel review the importance of biological diversity and assess what can be done to stem the loss of biological diversity. Biological diversity refers to the variety and variability among living organisms and the ecological complexes in which they occur. The term encompasses genetic species and ecosystem diversity. Conservation of biological diversity refers to maintaining the full abundance and distribution of these components. Biological diversity provides the raw materials for all the food that we eat, most pharmaceuticals and medicines, clothing and shelter. Biological diversity provides the basis for scientific inquiry and ideas for technological development. You will hear from scholars with the Smithsonian Institution and the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, among others. Good morning. The Subcommittee on the Environment of the Committee of, on Science, Space, and Technology will, will come to order. Today we're considering two pieces of legislation, H.R. 585, the, the National Biological Diversity and Research Act, and H.R. 2082, the National Biological Diversity Conservation Act. Uh, in the past year, several reports have been issued which lead us inexorably to the conclusion that the time for legislators to act on biological diversity is now. The Scientific Advisory Board of the Environmental Protection Administration uh, in a recent uh, report uh, entitled Setting Priorities and Strategies for Environmental Protection ranked habitat destruction and the loss of biological diversity and they're two sides of the same whole as two of the four greatest environmental problems facing the earth. In fact, they rank them number one and number two. <clears throat> now the Council on Environmental Qualities first annual, for a 21st annual report released in April of this year, claimed, and I quote, a vigorous response to the decline of endangered species uh, based on the Endangered Species Act remains essential, but the nation also needs new strategies to protect natural communities, that's a natural ecosystem, and biodiversity. Now that's a quote from the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, the Keystone Center came out with a fine report entitled Biological Diversity on Federal Lands, which concluded, among other things, that in spite of numerous positive federal, state, and private efforts underway, present efforts to conserve biological diversity are not completely adequate. And that's a masterpiece of understatement. In the past year alone, the world lost well over 2,000 species. Many of these losses were in the tropics, but the, new, uh, the United States was not uh, held safe from the devastation that scientists reported. <coughs> uh, for example, they reported that the rate of deforestation in Florida and in Hawaii exceed the rate of deforestation in Brazil. That's an awesome statement. Another area of concern for the U.S. is the fact that the Forest Service clear cuts approximately 60,000 of acres of virgin forest in the Pacific Northwest annually. This trend has disastrous consequences for many species, including the spotted owl and the Pacific yew, uh, the source of our latest anti-cancer drug. Uh, and apart from these individual losses, it seems to me unacceptable to us that with government sanction, we should be racing uh, in a rush to cut down the last great stands of old forest in the Pacific Northwest. How can we do this? Other habitats are vanishing in this country as well. Wetlands, for example, uh, are being destroyed at a rate of 250,000 acres per year. Hawaii, the national jewel of biological diversity, is also the capital of endangered uh, diversity. Rep representing 25% of the species listed on our endangered species list when it comprises only 1 or 2% of the land area of the United States. Today we'll hear from federal agencies on their past efforts. 
on their future plans, and on the present perception of the need to create a national policy on preserving biological diversity. <laughs> it's tragic that our government's past actions on this front have been piecemeal, uncoordinated, and lar largely reactive to past disasters. It's the purpose of this biological diversity legislation to reverse that and enable our society, federal, state, local governments, private citizens, nonprofit agencies, to enable every element in our society to perceive uh, the problem of <coughs> biological diversity in its whole terms, uh, in its uh, uh, holistic terms, looking at it not as an endangered species, but looking at the problem of how we preserve endangered ecosystems, each of them with perhaps thousands uh, of endangered species. Uh, this is the purpose of, uh, of our legislation on biological diversity. We'll receive testimony today from scientists, environmental groups, and industry representatives on this holistic, comprehensive legislative approach to preserving our priceless biological resources. Priceless and irreplaceable. Once they're gone, they are history. Before we hear from our distinguished witnesses, let me turn to an original co-sponsor of H.R. 585, Representative Don Ritter of Pennsylvania, our subcommittee's ranking Republican. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly want to commend you uh, for your leadership uh, from the very start in this very important area, and I'm very proud to be original co-sponsor of H.R. 585, your bill, the National Biological Diversity and Conservation Research Act. Biological diversity refers to a variety of life in all its forms, including genetic diversity within species, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. It's just the whole variety of communities of organisms in their physical settings. The Reducing Risk Report of EPA's Independent Science Advisory Board, Mr. Chairman, which you referred to, and I'll repeat here, calls for environmental protection to be based more on the risk posed by an environmental hazard. In the area of risks to the natural ecology and human welfare, the report ranked habitat alteration and destruction and species extinction and overall loss of biological diversity as two of the four highest risk problems. The Office of Technology Assessments report on biodiversity concludes that reduction in biodiversity could mean a serious disruption of the ecological processes on which civilization depends. The remarkable variety and variability of living organisms and the diversity of ecosystems in which they occur is very obviously worthy of protection. H.R. 585 seeks to establish a comprehensive scheme to protect biological diversity. At present, wildlife management and endangered species protection protect individual species. H.R. 585 would establish conservation of biological diversity as a national priority. This recognition of the value in maintenance and conservation of overall biological integrity is long overdue. And I'd like to welcome the witnesses here today, Mr. Chairman, and extend a personal welcome to Dr. Patricia Brott, Principal Research Scientist of Environmental Studies Center of Lehigh, uh, the Environmental Studies Center at Lehigh University in my congressional district. Dr. Brott is a noted expert in the field of biodiversity, having devoted many years of her life and much hard work to studying ecosystems in the Northeast of the United States. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent at this time to insert in the record of this hearing an article that Dr. Brott wrote in 1978 on biodiversity, which states... No objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman which states in part, quote, the diversity of species represents a heritage from millions of years of evolution. There are scientific, philosophical, and economic values in preserving this diversity. Mr. Chairman, I thought your comment about the uh, forests uh, disappearing at a uh, more rapid rate in Florida and Hawaii uh, than they do in Brazil is, is an extraordinary comment and uh, can show that the the uh, strong economic forces for development uh, can sometimes, in a, uh, in a modern industrial society, uh, 
uh, have far greater impact than what we see as the very spectacular uh, contra to counter environmental policies of uh, of uh, con trying to convert forest land to agricultural land in a, in a country like Brazil. I agree with the uh, statement that uh, Dr. Brat made about biological diversity and, and the tremendous uh, heritage. Uh, that we, we, uh, we own and that we should protect. Uh, and I commend you again, Mr. Chairman, for your years of leadership and hard work on this issue, and I look forward to a productive hearing on these proposals of biological divers diversity, conservation, and research, and I welcome our distinguished witnesses. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very short of time, and I'm going to ask the uh, members of the panel to keep their remarks to a minimum because we're going to lose a couple of our witnesses. Uh, Thank you. Congressman Sweat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will uh, keep my remarks brief. I want to commend you on your long-term commitment to this issue, and uh, you have displayed throughout my short tenure in Congress uh, a true commitment to forethought and planning. Uh, this is something that I think we need a great deal more of in this town, and this hearing today is going to address that problem uh, directly. Uh, one concern I have <coughs> that I hope our distinguished witnesses will address today is how we can avoid hurting the people who rely on the forests for their livelihood while protecting the long-term survival of species. I believe that we have a good model in New England that might be worth looking at. My district, the second district of New Hampshire, uh, is covered. Uh, three quarters of it is, is utilized for uh, forest lands. I hope that you will address that, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for this time. I yield back the remainder and ask that my statement be included in the record. There being no objection, so what is? And I thank my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Horn, of the state of Mar of the state of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I salute you for your longtime devotion to this issue. And I will submit a statement for the record, but I did not want to miss this opportunity to recognize and welcome to Washington, Dr. Peter Raven. We feel so fortunate that uh, that he stays in the St. Louis area because people from literally all over the world have tried to lure him away. Uh, as director of our Botanic Garden, Home Secretary of the National Academy of Science, eminent scholar and scientist, longtime curator of the University of Missouri, and just whenever there's a community activity that needs to be done, despite his busy schedule, he's out there working for the area, working for the community, working in these issues in which he is such a, a scholar. So we do welcome him today, and I will submit without objection the rest of my remarks. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you very, very much. Uh, in Japan, they know how to perceive of uh, people with towering reputations and towering records of service, such as Peter Raven and, and Tom Lovejoy. They call them national treasures. I think our two lead witnesses this morning uh, in, in every way constitute national treasures, and we're delighted to call them both to the witness table, along uh, with uh, Dr. Robert McAdam, Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Will the three of you please take your places? <clears throat> I might say when a person is declared a national treasure, there's a very elaborate uh, ceremonial uh, happening that takes place uh, at the home of the emperor in Tokyo. Now, if we ever get around to declaring people like our first panel national treasures, we'll, we'll, we'll have to figure out an appropriate ceremonial happening that would equal the dignity and the beauty of uh, this uh, ceremonial process that takes place in, in the uh, Garden of the Emperor of Japan. All right, uh, we're going to operate on the five minute rule, much uh, for as good a reason as any for the convenience of the witnesses who have to be off catching planes to far distant lands. Uh, that's of the witnesses and also of the, uh, the members on this side of the, of the uh, process here. All right, Mr. Robert McAdams, Dr. Robert McAdams, Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, please take your five minutes and for all of you, uh, know that your prepared testimony will be printed in full at the point in the record at which you testify. Dr. McAdams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I will be quite brief because my remarks will be supplemented by those of Dr. Tom Lovejoy, who is well known to you. Uh, 
I'm pleased to appear before you to express strongly the uh, Smithsonian's shared concerns for the objectives that are embodied in H.R. 585 and H.R. 2082. Uh, both of them, of course, concerned with conserving the diversity of fish, wildlife, and biological systems in the U.S. I would particularly note our warm support for the emphasis you have placed again this morning uh, on developing a national concern, a national policy, a comprehensive approach to this question. But I should, of course, go on to note that these are the views of the Smithsonian. Others uh, today will present those of the administration. The goals of these bills are those that the Smithsonian has pursued virtually since its founding in 1846. I have he here with, with me on the table, Mr. Chairman, the institution's, uh, one of the institution's earliest publications, uh, a volume uh, uh, authored by the institution's second secretary, describing biological surveys along the proposed courses of the, of the uh, uh, first transcontinental railroads. Uh, and that this was is, in the 1830s, as I recall. Well, the institution was founded in 1846. These surveys were carried on in 1853, as it yes. happens. Yes, I, I, I uh, examined that volume, mm -hmm. and they are lovely. They're beautiful. My only, uh, my only regret is that uh, uh, color printing wasn't in vogue <laughs> at that time. So the book really doesn't do justice to many of the plants and animals they describe. Uh, members of, of our staff, led by Dr. Frank Talbot, the director of our National Museum of Natural History, uh, have yeah. conducted intensive discussions over the past year on the concept of the, of the bill uh, with uh, the Association of Systematics Collections, with representatives of the conservation community, and with the Fish and Wildlife Service. The concept converges with the highest priorities of many of the bureaus of the Smithsonian, including our uh, Tropical Research Institute, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center uh, on Chesapeake Bay at Edgewater, Maryland, uh, and the National Zoological Park, in addition to the National Museum of Natural History. Thus, many specialists on our staff already have had considerable input into the plans for a national center. It has their warm support as it has mine. The Smithsonian's regents, its governing body, have been kept apprised of these discussions and proposed legislative efforts. The timing of their meeting is such that it has not been possible to submit a detailed proposal covering our participation in the center for their formal approval, but I anticipate that mutual agreement can be reached on legislative language that they will accept. For the information of the subcommittee, I'm submitting for the record answers to questions that the Subcommittee on Fisheries and Wildlife Conservation and the Environment addressed to us. Uh, Tom Lovejoy, who as I know is well known to you, uh, is here with me today and he will be glad to respond to, to any further inquiries that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from uh, Tom Lovejoy, the uh, Assistant Secretary for External Affairs at the Smithsonian, but a preeminent persona with a marvelous worldwide reputation in the environment and in biodiversity. This is Dr. Lovejoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testified today in support of uh, this uh, really very important legislation which you have been uh, such a champion for. Uh, it seemed to me that maybe one of the useful things I could do would be to talk about the issue and the challenge in terms of a particular example. We've all seen uh, in the recent press uh, the description of an, ap an apparent conflict in the forests of, of the Northwest uh, where the Pacific yew uh, tree grows and the bark of which has uh, an important compound in it, Taxol, which it turns out is extremely useful uh, in treating certain kinds of cancer. Uh, I think, first of all, the point needs to be made uh, that if partial biological inventory of this country uh, had not already been undertaken. And if indeed the old growth forest no longer existed, we wouldn't even know about this in important new compound for the treatment of one of the diseases with which afflicts our society. Uh, I mean, it's an example of the power of ideas about biological processes and biological systems 
uh, which can emerge from the variety of life on Earth, uh, and not the least of which are just fundamental concepts like vaccination or antibiotics, the importance of which hardly need to be underscored. Had we advanced further in the process of biological inventory in this country, uh, apparent conflicts like the one between the old growth forests seen as an economic resource for timber as opposed to a source of biological diversity in medicine, we would have been able to avoid those conflicts. Uh, conducting biological inventory allows us to plan development uh, in wise and sustainable ways uh, to get ahead of these conflicts which are always very difficult uh, when we get to them at the last minute. One of the really serious problems we have is that we don't even know the full array of species we share this country with. Uh, of course, the, the vertebrates and the flowering plants and certain other groups are very well known, but when it comes down to invertebrates and many decomposing organisms, uh, the level of knowledge is approaching the superficial. Indeed, it is asserted that one can pick up a handful of soil anywhere in this country and the majority of organisms will not be known. And yet it is these very organisms which are generating the fertility of our soils, supporting our agriculture, supporting our forests uh, and ecology in general. Indeed, it's a, just a very good example of how it's the green plants and the decomposers and what I sometimes call the squirmies, how they really run the world and we vertebrates uh, are along for the ride. We just desperately need a center which can map this biological diversity so we can manage it and use it more wisely. Uh, and that uh, I'm sure Peter Raven will talk about in, in greater uh, depth. In my view, it must be an essentially freestanding center uh, and one which draws on uh, the expertise that lies in uh, federal, state, and private agencies all across this country, uh, including such notable ones as the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and lastly, I would say that the example of this country is just paramount uh, as far as this question is concerned uh, around the world. True, the bulk of biological diversity is in the tropical forests, uh, but our ability to help and encourage the tropical nations to do what really needs to be done with those forests really rests uh, in what we do here in this country. And were we seen to be undertaking uh, the sensible inventory of our biological resources, it would encourage the proper kinds of activities elsewhere in the world. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Lovejoy. And now Dr. Peter, Re uh, Dr. Peter Raven. <clears throat> Dr. Peter Raven, Director of the Missouri Botanical Garden and testifying on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and the Association of Systematic Collections. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to be able to address you today on this topic and particularly to begin by congratulating you and the members of this subcommittee, but especially you for your relentless and, and, and useful pursuit of these objectives, which we hold to be so important. And we really appreciate it. And it looks as if the time may be ripe for some action on it now. The legislation, H.R. 585, on which you and your staff have worked so ably and for so long is now approaching a maturity where it really does look like a document ready to become law. We badly need in the United States a comprehensive national policy for dealing with the environment. Over the past 20 years, we've been wrestling with how to put together the various parts of this, and a number of mission-oriented agencies have been charged with particular tasks that relate directly to the use of biological diversity and its preservation. A national biological center of the sort envisioned in H.R. 585 is badly needed to provide the kind of database on which informed actions can be taken by these institutions and by all other interested parties. 
The database that would be produced and organized and made available as a result of a national biological survey would serve not only the fundamentally important purpose of conservation, but would also serve the purpose of intelligent, sustainable development and use of natural resources, something that we should not forget. It would also serve educational purposes and scientific purposes. It's precisely for that reason that a national biological center, biological diversity center, should not be located, in my opinion, in a, neither in a mission-oriented agency, regardless of how effective the programs of that agency may be, because they must of necessity be highly focused on the purposes of the agency, nor, for example, run by a private conservation-oriented organization such as the Nature Conservancy, which is doing a splendid job for many years in preserving the nation's biological heritage, especially through its state heritage programs, and will continue to do so in the future with all of our help. Those are all particular parts of the body of information that can and should be organized in a national biological biodiversity center. This, for example, decisions about how to buy land or what land ought to be acquired federally could be made in the light of the information available in the database at the center, but the center itself would not make the decisions about what land to buy. By the same token, it does not appear appropriate for the legislation that we're testifying about now H.R. 585 to deal with the subject of buying land, commendable as those efforts are, and important as it will be to add in a substantial and suitable way to the nation's patrimony. The Smithsonian Institution, which has been doing a wonderful job in the field of biological diversity for 145 years and contributing substantially to the world's found uh, um, information in this area, the Smithsonian Institution appears to many of us to be an ideal institution to house the National Biodiversity Center because of the comprehensive nature of its collections, its libraries, and its scientific staff, and perhaps most of all because of its ability to form linkages with the many other institutions around the country, hundreds of individual institutions with their staffs contributing, contributing on an ongoing and substantial way to the accumulation of information about biological diversity. Assuming that the center be set up in the Smithsonian Institution, we would all expect it to form linkages for coordination with the concerned federal agencies in an effective and ongoing way, and certainly linkages with private organizations such as especially the Nature Conservancy and its state heritage programs, which are so worthwhile and so important to us all. I would conclude by reference to what might be seen as a kind of a prototype of a national biodiversity center and a national biological survey. The Flora of North America program, which is coordinated by my own institution, the Missouri Botanical Garden, and which is building a comprehensive database to serve users of many kinds. Floristics for the 21st century, the report of which I've made available's copy outside, details what these users are, the full array of those users, and I think provides a concrete example through this project, an interinstitutional project, of the sort of thing that we have in mind. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Raven. Uh, it's been said, and I will address this to, the, to both of the members of the panel, that the most uh, significant things our nation can do for the world's environment is to change our policies toward the environment. Uh, will this legislation enhance the U.S. position abroad as we continue to negotiate international treaties on biodiversity, forestry, and other environmental issues? Either of you. I recently came from a meeting of the Association of Systematics Collections held at Texas A&M University, and the people who were there from the United States were literally embarrassed by the aggressive and comprehensive efforts being made all over the world to deal with biological diversity in the light of the fact that, each, that many nations are now recognizing it 
as, the, as an essential part of their patrimony which underlies the productivity of their, of their nations. For example, in Australia, the um, Biological Research Service has organized a biological inventory which is cataloging and dealing with Australian biodiversity for the benefit of all Australians in a comprehensive way and has been doing so for 20 years. The vigor of our economy is so all-pervasive that we're destroying our own national bio biodiversity very rapidly. We need to begin to get a handle on that and take our actions in a more concentrated and organized way so that future generations can organize the benefits that we do. We need to do that Dr. because Raven. of our use, Dr. but we need to do it for leadership also. We need to give an example, and that's why this is particularly important. I have heard you say before that the, out, the onrush and the extreme pace of development activities of all kinds uh, impinges negatively on our biodiversity in a variety of ways. Can you tick off some of those negative impacts on the environment that flows from the rush of our civilization? Finally, individually and collectively, the plants, animals, microorganisms, and fungi in the United States are the basic commodities on which we have to base our future. If you took any county in the Midwestern United States and knew the set of butterfly species that were in it 75 years ago, you'd probably find half as many there now. We were not categorizing biological diversity 75 years ago well enough to be able to chart that effectively. We were not categorizing it well enough to know what we've lost, and we think it's high time to establish a benchmark. But I would emphasize again that we're talking not only about preservation, but about intelligent use and exploitation. And in order to do that, we have to understand what we have much better than we do now. What are the things that have made that vast reduction in biological diversity in those Midwest meadows and forests and whatnot? Uh, unsophisticated and wasteful use of energy for transportation, widespread pollution, an unwillingness to limit the way that we apply pesticides and herbicides over the United States, uh, a poor use of farmlands, historically poor use of farmlands, the whole array of issues that EPA and CEQ and many other agencies are addressing effectively now, but putting them all together and giving the intensity of our economic development, we've lost an enormous amount. We want to get a handle on what we have, and we want to use that information in order to be able to take better actions in the future. Uh, <coughs> yes, uh, Mr. Dr. McAdams. I'd like to return to your original question for just a moment and use as an example Brazil. Uh, it is obviously of critical importance, of world importance, that the, that the approach taken by that great country to its enormous resources in the Amazon basin be, be one that is consistent with the, the uh, kind of approach that you're calling for in this bill. Uh, let me sp spend just a moment on the, on the political difficulty of having that happen there. Brazil has appointed an environmentalist as its minister of the environment. Uh, who nevertheless has an exceedingly difficult and demanding political task in coming to terms with the very erosive forms of land use, whether it be gold mining or, or ranching or whatever, that are being uh, carried on in an exploitative way in the Amazon basin. As long as the argument can stand that the developed nations like the U.S. in the 19th century were moving in the same way as we are now in Brazil, uh, and as long as we cannot show that there has been a real change of heart in the United States, the, the problems facing that Minister of the Environment are perhaps insuperable. I'm coming in a, in a sense to the point that my colleague Tom Lovejoy made before he had to run for a plane. Uh, I think it is really of world importance that we show that the United States is, in, is ready to take the position of leadership that it ought to occupy in this area. Well, I quite agree with you. <clears throat> I remember the Minister of Development uh, for the state that forms the Amazon being quoted in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago as saying, Defor for us, deforestation equals survival. Now, 
That, that, that's a devastating statement for him to make. And of course, what he doesn't understand is the fact that deforestation equals not only environmental degradation, but economic degradation. Because the one thing that we have learned about a tropical rainforest is that the most productive use for that tropical rainforest, uh, it, the most productive use for the land under a tropical rainforest is to remain just that, land under a tropical rainforest. And that once you cut down that rainforest and convert the land to farming, it leaches out and after several years it really won't grow crops. Uh, if you want to uh, use that land for growing beef cattle to, to produce hamburgers for McDonald's, after a couple of years it won't even support cattle. And the, fa the land is abandoned and then the folks move on to yet, yet another 100,000 acres or so of rainforest. And we've learned that <clears throat> uh, land under a tropical rainforest is uh, potentially a very productive thing and that the productivity of rainforests themselves can be enhanced by planting uh, numerous uh, cash crops of very high value, annual cash crops like nuts, oils, fragrances, and uh, a, a variety of valuable crops that can be interspersed with the tropical rainforest. So in, until they reach that understanding, <clears throat> uh, there's not going to be much progress in reducing the rate of elimination of tropical rainforest. And I'm sure that they would come back and say, well, until you folks understand that you're wasting hundreds of billions of dollars in futile and silly uh, uses of energy, uh, you're going to, you're going to uh, uh, by ignoring the enormous benefits of energy conservation, of the development of alternative uh, uh, means of transportation like electric automobiles and gas power and uh, natural gas powered automobiles, alternative sources of energy in this country, uh, you too uh, are going to continue to degrade your economy and degrade your environment. So both the developed and the developing countries have to, uh, have to uh, really get their act together. Let me ask you uh, about this uh, center, this environment center, and wherever it's located, whether it's the Smithsonian or some other place, uh, there'll be a need uh, for a high degree of cooperation between various agencies and organizations of government, <coughs> And, uh, and the scientific and public and private organizations. There'll be a need, a high, ne high degree of cooperation required to generate the information and use the information intelligently about our biodiversity. How will this arrangement work in terms of fostering cooperation uh, among this incredible uh, diver d diversity of agencies, institutions, and peoples. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'd like to be uh, uh, quite uh, brief on that matter because, uh, as I've already indicated, uh, I think the question of the design of that center is one that still has, still is at an early stage. But, but certainly this, the thinking within the Smithsonian on the matter uh, is that its functions are, as has already been suggested, Facilitative and coordinative. We do not see the creation of a great new bureaucracy here. We see something which, as Peter Raven already indicated, has got to reach out uh, both to all of the federal agencies who have stakes in this matter and to the many private organizations that are, that are also active. And uh, I think we're talking about a, a relatively small uh, uh, center of a relatively small number of, of staff who are engaged in primarily in bringing together and making accessible, uh, mutually accessible to all of these organizations, the, the separate contributions that they're now making. It'll be the central nervous system, yeah. really, of the environment community. Maybe, uh, Dr. Raven, you might tell us, how might such a center of biodiversity be structured to get the most out of all the relevant parties, the museum scientists, the scientists on your own, uh, on the staff of the uh, Smithsonian, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Agriculture, pharmaceutical researchers who are making 
uh, great strides and who are encouraging us to preserve our biological diversity because an enormous percentage of new uh, medicines and new drugs come from the forest. Uh, how do we get the most out of this diverse uh, leadership population? Basically, the center is an information organizing operation. I see that as happening through a large-scale relational database and I see the many organizations, both governmental and private, and I, I would stress, underline again as I did before and as you just reminded us, industrial participation in this, exploitative, extractive participation in it, educational participation in it, scientific participation in it. I think that those groups need to be not, not I, would, I would suggest not in a one-to-one -one or representational way be on the board of the center, but I think that they need to be represented on the board of the center. I think that they have to participate in setting priorities and standards and operations for the center. And the center itself then will operate in such a way as to provide for them what they need. I think if we can look on this as a tool for managing the nation's biological diversity in a way that will serve the needs of Americans best, a tool that we haven't got now, a way of organizing and thinking about using, saving, loving, appreciating that biodiversity, then I think we can see how it would operate. All of those agencies, industry, universities, and other bodies as well would have to provide continual input through formulae still to be developed and to take out of it, to get out of it what they want. We have, of course, a great body of information now, but it is so dispersed that it doesn't come to bear immediately on the, on the points where we want it to come to bear. It's difficult to get to. We don't know very well where the gaps are in our information. That's what we'd like this center to do by coordinating and elevating our national effort to a new level and putting us on a par with many other nations around the world who are already doing this quite effectively. It uh, shouldn't be a threat to the mission-oriented agencies. They should see it as a way of enhancing and informing their own activities, which are perfectly valid and ought to be strengthened. Do you envisage that uh, private sector companies that uh, have a real expertise in these matters might be included on your board, like some of the pharmaceutical I, companies. I like certainly an do. an outfit like the Weyerhaeuser uh, Lumber Company that has had very enlightened uh, policies on sustainable yield uh, uh, cutting of the forest. I absolutely do. I think yes. it's not only uh, <clears throat> uh, desirable, but I think it's necessary. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn to my uh, ranking mm -hmm. minority member. Uh, Congressman Don Ritter of Pennsylvania. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you know we we need to uh, again commend you. This is I think some six years that you have been involved in in this issue, and now we I, I believe see it coming to fruition. Um, there are there is another bill that uh, has recently. Uh, Come, come out from uh, the Merchant Marine and Fisheries uh, Committee, um, HR 20082. Uh, they are somewhat later uh, in this than uh, the chairman and uh, his subcommittee. But uh, HR 585 proposes to locate the Biodiversity Center in the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, Dr. McAdams, HR 2082 is silent as to the location is of the center. Uh, you've testified that it would be advantageous to locate the center in, in the Smithsonian Institution. Are, are there any other governmental agencies that uh, you can think of that might be appropriate choices for the location of the center? And why? Mr. Ritter, as I, as I said at the outset, uh, <coughs> in the absence of formal action by our Board of Regents, I would hesitate to go further than and to express a very personal point of view on this matter, but it's a point of view which has also been extensively vetted by our, by our, relative, uh, our, our relevant uh, staff in this area. Uh, we do think, uh, we at the staff level, do think that the Smithsonian would be effective in this respect, but I don't want to say that it couldn't be located alternatively in the Fish and Wildlife Service or in some other place. I don't want to 
to speak out strongly on that matter because, uh, uh, first of all, we're a party at interest, but, but secondly, I think there really is room for a variety of solutions to the problem of which the Smithsonian deserves consideration as one. Dr. McAdams, uh, the other witnesses here today from various federal agencies that have an interest in biodiversity are going to testify that the legislation is either unnecessary because existing statutory authority is sufficient or premature because arrangements such as that provided by the Keystone Center, and a uh, very uh, capable center in Colorado, have allowed for uh, ever increasing interagency cooperation. Um, uh, and uh, the results of their efforts should be considered before further legislation is considered. Uh, how do you respond to those criticisms? I think I would share the characterization that the chairman offered in his preliminary remarks that the, that the effort at present is fragmentary uh, and that what we are looking for, what we need, uh, is something that draws this together and galvanizes the nation into serious action in this respect. And, and uh, uh, I don't doubt that one could take a slower approach and perhaps get there uh, in a period of years, but I'm afraid that the problem of biodiversity is moving ahead even more rapidly and that if we really want to respond to it uh, with the, with the uh, uh, degree of, of seriousness that the problem deserves, we ought to do it in the way that is suggested here. Chairman alluded to this uh, in his questions. In terms of specific examples, how would a, uh, a concrete national policy on diversity uh, differ from uh, existing statute and protection well, efforts? Yeah. I, I, Dr. Raven. I first of all would like to refer to the fact that uh, in my written testimony I specifically endorsed the ideas expressed in uh, HR 2082 about an enhanced role for the Fish and Wildlife Service and for the support for the Nature Conservancy State Heritage Programs and the Nature Conservancy centrally because of their very great effectiveness but I would underscore again the fact that in my opinion those are and should be mission-oriented operations designed to serve specific needs, the preservation of wildlife, for example, and are most appropriate, ought to be pursued, but do not serve the purpose of a comprehensive overall center for biodiversity. Uh, the reason that I think it can better be situated in a place such as the Smithsonian Institution is that in its comprehensive nature, the Smithsonian and non-mission oriented uh, focus, the Smithsonian has the ability to put together all the elements that are required to serve the needs not only of conservation, not only to help in the organization of plans in fish and wildlife, in EPA, in the Nature Conservancy, and all the other organizations that have good and justifiable purposes, but also, for example, to serve the needs of industry, of the pharmaceutical industry, of the forest industry, of the educational establishments in the country, and so forth. And I think that a, a non-mission oriented agency such as the Smithsonian has a much better chance of doing this and that the coordination would be perfectly reasonable. The Keystone Report, which is a commendable document, makes it very clear to me, or I believe that the Keystone Report illustrates the kind of thing that happens when basic information and the scientists and the scientific institutions who put together that information are not taken into account. It's an outstanding description of what all the federal agencies are doing with the Nature Conservancy, a private organization thrown in, but it does not add up in any sense to a national policy for dealing with biodiversity. And I say again because I think it's so important that dealing with biodiversity involves more than conserving it, important as conserving it is. It involves using it intelligently, learning about it, and serving many, many different purposes. No center would be complete without the input of the scientific community, the hundreds of institutions that are actually developing the knowledge on which all these actions are to be based. And that's why I think that the, the summary situation you've outlined doesn't add up to the whole in the way that this legislation does. I thank the gentlemen for their testimony and uh, yield back the balance of my time. I thank my colleague. Uh, Congressman Dick Sweat of the state of New Hampshire.
<clears throat> Thank you. I will be brief. I have uh, one comment and one question. Uh, I, too, am a co-sponsor of this legislation, so in, in one sense I feel like I'm uh, preaching or, or questioning the, the choir. Um, but my, my question is, for, for the record, uh, and this may be putting the, the cart before the horse, uh, is the establishment of, of such a uh, research center as what we are talking about uh, something that, uh, as you mentioned earlier in the, uh, the chairman's uh, questioning, uh, as we establish our uh, position on this, we will have an impact on nations around the world by our leadership. Uh, is this going to be something that we ought to be including in on our negotiations with other countries in the establishment of free trade practices? Uh, I believe that the best model for protecting and using biodiversity intelligently around the world would be the establishment of similar operations in other countries around the world. Costa Rica has an advanced uh, form of this. We recently visited Taiwan. They're in the process of establishing one. Since only 6% of the world's scientists and engineers live in developing countries, which have 77% of the total world population, we can see readily that most countries have no capability internally for deciding to do anything about their own biodiversity and that the establishment of operations such as this as a matter of, as a matter of national priority could serve their own developmental interests very well indeed. Specifically, we're also working very hard in Mexico and lots of consideration is being given in Mexico to try to establish this. Canada is already more advanced than we are in this field. It would be a very good idea and very beneficial for the Republic of Mexico to have an operation just like this, and they are basically moving towards it. The thing that this kind of an operation does is it makes a country possess, understand, want to conserve, and use its own biodiversity intelligently, it breaks through the kind of parochialism that makes it impossible to forge sound international agreements because you feel that it's yours and you therefore are free to deal with it. So I think I would say very definitely so. It is a matter for international discussion, cooperation, and to the extent that our budget will allow us support in other nations around the world. Thank you very much. I'd love to follow up, but I will, in the interest of time, yield back my time to the chair. I thank my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Horn of the State of Missouri. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on something that had been said before. Uh, in putting, if there a center is together, and I certainly fully support that, are there going to be a lot of agencies uh, in the public or uh, even in private sector businesses who are going to have a lot of information they're going to consider very proprietary and that will not be shared. What do you see as the culture of sharing information uh, in both the public sector and the private sector? I think that uh, if, an if an objectively constituted center with proper representation would be set up in, a, in an organization such as the Smithsonian Institution, which clearly has no axe to grind in this kind of a field that there would be widespread sharing. Some information obviously is proprietary, but obviously there are ways of protecting it if it goes into the center. If the cooperating parties feel that they're getting as much or more out of it as they're putting into it, then I think there'd be no difficulty at all. And as far as I can tell, that would unequivocally be the case because the information on which they need to base their conservation plans or the information on which they would need to base their own economic strategies would be so much more available by being so much better organized that they would they would welcome it, participate in it, and I think the problem would be minimal. Just to complete that thought, um, is the sum total of the uh, funds available through these various uh, uh, private uh, and, uh, and public uh, Nature Conservancy and the Fish and Wildlife EPA, plus the dollars that will be put into the center, does that even begin to allow with coordination and focus uh, uh, to get from here to there where we need to be? All of those agencies are underfunded for the tasks that they want to set forth. For example, the GAPS program of the Fish and Wildlife Service clearly could perform a valuable 
National Service as they position it as a beginning cut on dealing with biodiversity, but would need more funding to do that. The Nature Conservancy's sponsored state heritage program, which now quite properly amounts to a number of independent state programs uh, coordinated uh, nationally, uh, could obviously do much better with more support, and that's why I specifically think that the idea of providing more support in H.R. 2082 is worthwhile. But aside from the question of level of funding, the kind of brain or nervous system or center for this whole apparatus is missing, and it's precisely the idea of providing that central coordination. That's the reason that we're here. That's the reason that we commend Congressman Scheuer and the members of this committee for pursuing this legislation so far. There is not only inadequate funding, a story that every agency can justifiably present, but there's a whole missing element of coordination which is badly needed as a basis for thinking about how to provide more funding. These operations should not be thought of as competitive. They should be thought of as organizing a, a really respectable national effort in a highly critical area. Thank you. That, that uh, helps a lot. I, I, just as a final comment, I, I am a little uh, um, unnerved by some of the testimony to come about that we, do, that we don't need this. That, that, says, that doesn't sound like the scientists. That perhaps sounds like some more turf conscious, uh, uh, perhaps at other levels. And I, and I think in the scientific community, uh, you're certainly representing their viewpoint. I appreciate that th uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman uh, This terminates this panel. I want to thank you for your very excellent testimony. It's been thoughtful, provocative to a degree, and, uh, and a very fine testimony. Thank you very much. Now we've completed the um, the uh, the uh, the introductory uh, panel, and now we'll go to uh, three more panels. The first will be the federal panel. The second will be the private sector panel, and the third will be uh, representatives of some of the uh, some of the well-known and prestigious environment organizations. For the second panel, we'll welcome Mr. Michael DeLand, Chairman of the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, Dr. Courtney Reardon, Director of the Office of Environmental Processes and Effects Research at the EPA. And third, Mr. Doug Buffington, Regional Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. All right. <clears throat> we're delighted to have you all. Uh, we're on a strict five-minute rule because we must be out of this room by noon, and we expect the roll call vote to intervene and consume close to 15 minutes. Uh, your entire prepared testimony will be printed in full at the point at which you uh, testify. So, uh, Mr. DeLand, you've been a frequent uh, and very welcome uh, visitor to this subcommittee. Your testimony has always been excellent. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and your subcommittee again, and I join in commending you for your continuing leadership on this issue of critical import. A decade ago, CEQ's annual report to Congress was among the first voices to define biodiversity and to warn us of the consequences of its loss. Uh, this year, the Council once again devoted an entire chapter to the subject. I would note that the author of that chapter, Robin O'Malley, CEQ's Associate Director of Natural Resources, is here with me today. I would also note that for the first time ever, this particular CEQ report was peer-reviewed by outside experts uh, during its formulation. The biodiversity chapter, for example, was reviewed by those two national treasures from whom we've heard this morning, uh, Tom Lovejoy and uh, Peter Raven, and also by E.O. Wilson of Harvard, who I suspect you would also uh, put in a similar or the same uh, category. This year's report makes two major points. First, that the loss of biological diversity is a domestic problem as well as an international one. And second, there is much which could be done to reduce our losses. Another major milestone in the past year was that 
of the Keystone Dialogue Group. The Keystone made substantial progress in defining within current missions and institutions what can be done to turn federal land use policies toward protection of biodiversity. Clearly, loss of biodiversity is a major problem in the United States. And just as clearly, for practical, moral, aesthetic reasons, that loss must be stopped. The question is, what can be done? CEQ and others who have looked at this question agree on two basic policy directions. These two principles also underline, underlie the legislative proposals before you. First, we have more to learn, much more, about the living world around us. And second, that there is more, again, much more, which we could do to incorporate the effects of actions on biodiversity into our decision making. CEQ's annual report signals an official recognition by the administration that the subject of biodiversity protection merits policy attention, and not just study, but action. This recognition mirrors the proposal in both bills being considered to establish biodiversity protection as a national goal. While heartily endorsing the principles which prompted it, we do not feel that legislation of this sweep is necessary. That said, biodiversity protection clearly needs to be a prime national priority. The role which CEQ plays managing issues which cross interagency boundaries is directly relevant in dealing with biodiversity. In both the policy development and the National Environmental Policy Act compliance, CEQ will remain involved and work with the agencies in our coordinating role. We've already hosted an interagency briefing on the results of the Keystone process and have had informal discussions with several agencies regarding implementing the report's recommendations. However, we do have concerns with a requirement in H.R. 585 that CEQ issue regulations requiring consideration of biodiversity in NEPA documents. <coughs> We prefer to rely on the existing authority of NEPA. And under the broad reach of that uh, statute, all reasonably foreseeable impacts upon our environment, clearly including those upon biodiversity, are covered. Within that general mandate, we prefer to concentrate our efforts on more applied how-to style guidance, as would be required under HR 2082. Irrespective of legislation, we plan to work with the agencies dealing with this issue on the development of such guidance. The second major issue in biodiversity policy is a need for better information on the world around us. The dearth of our information, as has been indicated, is uh, shocking. And not only are we lacking in information, there is, much inf there is much which exists but is difficult, if not impossible, to correlate. The annual report focused on the concept of a database of databases to link together these many elements. We also recognize the need for gathering more and better information on species and ecosystem dynamics. In sum, I strongly encourage federal agencies, private university, museum researchers, and nonprofit organizations such as the Nature Conservancy to continue their productive efforts. Mr. Chairman, I believe we are in fundamental agreement as to the basic policy directions we must pursue if we are to reduce the loss of biodiversity. I believe the federal government is moving in these directions, but clearly there is much, much more to be done, and I again applaud you for your continuing leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. DeLand. And now Dr. Courtney Reardon, Director of the Office of Environmental Processes and Effects Research of the EPA. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm accompanied by Dr. Peter Utro, who is responsible for developing plans for our research as to how we might better help the agency in addressing the problems of biodiversity. EPA shares in the judgment that the loss of biodiversity is probably one of the major environmental problems that we face today in the nation and in the world. Uh, already, reference has been made twice to the EPA Scientific Advisory Board panel report, which identified the loss of biodiversity as one of the four major risks to the environment that we ought to pay attention to 
in the United States, and the administrator of EPA has concurred in this judgment and is seeking to infuse this priority of paying attention to lo loss of biodiversity in our programs across the board. Species considerations already enter into many agency concerns, but we now realize that many problems have to be dealt with at a higher level of aggregation. Uh, in particular, in the long run, for example, we need a better understanding of habitats on a landscape and regional scale and how our pollution control activities impact uh, communities at that level in order to make informed decisions about biological diversity. We, however, realize that we need much additional research and experience if we're going to be able to manage at that scale of operation. We already now are supporting research that examines documented cases of losses of species to see whether we can find ways to better manage our programs in order to avoid those impacts. Biodiversity is one of the adverse impacts that we are examining relative to our climate change research program. In addition, we are looking at the impacts of air pollution on biodiversity. And late last year, our policy office published a report entitled Threats to Biodiversity in the United States. As a result of our experience, we do see the need for additional coordination relative to data and research on the issue of biodiversity. For example, EPA shares on one major goal of the proposed legislation, that of undertaking a national coordinated effort to collect, synthesize, and disseminate data on the distribution status and characteristics of biodiversity as a resource. Uh, EPA does believe that there are benefits to having centralized biodiversity or, and biotic data in a clearinghouse situation. In conclusion, it seems clear within the agency that the protection of biodiversity is a high priority uh, goal that has to be addressed if we are to responsibly manage the environment as part of our nat national heritage. Uh, in addition, we do support the idea of better integration and coordination relative to research and data distribution, but we do see opportunities for achieving that within the existing authorities of the federal agencies. This concludes my formal statement, Mr. Chairman. Myself and Peter Utro are prepared to answer any questions you might have. <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Riordan. And now Dr. Uh, John Buffington. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, life in Washington is full of surprises. At 9.30, Director Turner walked into my office and told me he had just gotten a uh, call to appear in the Senate on another biodiversity hearing associated with ANWR. And uh, given the comparative urgency of the two biodiversity issues, he expresses regrets. But we're happy to have you. Thank you, sir. Uh, as one of those uh, rarefied administrators, I've had the uh, privilege of testifying before you on this issue on several other occasions. And while in that capacity, I've never been able to support uh, your legislation. I would point out that as one of those unheard scientists, I personally do uh, express my gratitude for you to keep this issue before the, uh, uh, the public and the scientific community. I think you've done a great service. Uh, a few comments on the, on the legislation and on the Fish and Wildlife Service role. The Fish and Wildlife Service has regarded itself as a biodiversity agency since uh, the founding of one of its predecessor agencies in the 19th century. In fact, that agency was called the Bureau of the Biological Survey. Uh, we feel that our basic missions and authorities provide us all the authority we may need, but we also feel that we carry out those authorities and that we have been a major uh, leader in terms of preserving the nation's and, for that matter, the world's biodiversity through uh, uh, the, here, the period of our history. We have the expertise to bear on it in the institutional framework. I continually have to remind the the senior administrators within the Fish and Wildlife Service that if we're doing our job well, if we're managing our refuges well, if we're managing our, hatch our hatcheries appropriately uh, to maintain uh, natural genotypes, uh, if we are carrying out our mandate under the Endangered Species Act, if we're doing our research activities correctly, uh, our responsibilities on the Clean Water Bill, that in fact we are carrying out our mandate to maintain the nation's biodiversity. I would point out that we have major data go gathering efforts gone underway. For example, the National Wetlands Inventory, which uh, has been going on for well over a decade, is currently spending $8 million a year just to inventory, map, and classify one component of biodiversity. Our Migratory Bird Office spends about $8 million a year on data acquisition, uh, keeping, and, and um, a provision on the issue of migratory birds. The gap analysis activity, which is 
emerging as one of the major tools underlying our ability to deal with the biodiversity issue is being funded in the 92 President's budget at $1 million. And you mentioned Hawaii earlier in your, your own statement. I would point out that in my own organization, I have about well over a million dollars a year going into research on Hawaiian birds. So the service has, so to speak, put its money where its mouth is on the biodiversity issue. We are working with other federal agencies. We are coordinating with them. Uh, I just came this week from a discussion with the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, Bureau of Land Management, other federal agencies, and a large contingent of, of the uh, uh, outside scientific and co conservation community. We are developing a joint neotropical migratory bird initiative, which is showing tremendous progress. Uh, we are using Keystone, along with the other federal agencies, as a starting point. We are reviewing what our participation in the Keystone effort uh, has resulted in. We are looking to see where it should lead us. In this regard, I believe we would agree that, it, that it's, it's premature for a legally required effort. In terms of the National Center, I guess I would point out that uh, while the administration clearly has stated that it doesn't feel that such a center is needed, uh, there have been informal discussions among many people, both on the executive agencies and the congressional uh, committees, and recognizing that there are many federal agencies and outside groups that are working in this area. Uh, one concept that has emerged at the discussion level is the center without walls, taking advantage of existing capabilities, ex existing budgets, uh, and pull these things together and, and build on what we have instead of start, starting something new. However, as Director Turner stated yesterday in the hearing before Mr. Studs, if there is a desire to create such a new institution, the Fish and Wildlife Service will feel very comfortable uh, as providing a, a, a house, a home, and a, and a uh, operating base for such an organization. And finally, uh, I do note that you have called this hearing to review both H.R. 585 and H.R. 2082. I guess our feeling is that 2082 does provide a reasonable evolution of H.R. 585, and of the two bills, we feel more comfortable with 2082 than 585, even though our official position on both of them is that they're not needed at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, congratulations for keeping this issue before us. <clears throat> Thank you very much. If you're pressed for time, I'll recognize you first. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> we do have a roll call vote on now. Uh, we're not going to be able to finish the questions before we have to leave, which is in about five or six minutes. But <clears throat> we'll nevertheless commence with the questions, and I'll recognize Congressman Don Ritter of Pennsylvania, our ranking minority member and a very uh, strong and loyal and longtime supporter of this bill. Congressman Ritter. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeLand, um, you state that a specific guidance on the consideration of biodiversity and actions under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, such as environmental impact statements, is unnecessary from a legal viewpoint since NEPA already applies to all reasonably foreseeable impacts on the environment. Yet several other witnesses here today testify that environmental impact statements do not take impacts uh, on biodiversity into account because it's not explicitly required. Um, I know it's a very complex issue, and I just wanted to get your best thoughts and perhaps some of the thoughts of, of some of the others on the record here. It, it, is, it is a complex issue, uh, Congressman Ritter. Uh, our feeling is that NEPA uh, gives the statutory authority uh, to include biodiversity in uh, all environmental impact uh, statements. Uh, that admittedly is not being so done in all. What I would propose to do is for CEQ to issue uh, guidance uh, to the agencies, uh, basically directing them to uh, take biodiversity uh, considerations into account. Let me ask you this. Do you, is, it, uh, is it a fear on the part of some of you that uh, if you actually try to legislate biodiversity uh, formally, you could basically stop just about anything on the basis of one or another individual microorganism potentially suffering from an action, a man-made action? Uh, 
Well, that, that could be a consequence. Uh, from my more parochial vantage point, uh, I am concerned about uh, any tinkering with that Constitution-like document uh, NEPA that we have. It does give uh, sweeping uh, mandates uh, to uh, CEQ to reach into biodiversity and virtually any other uh, issue affecting our environment. So I would be very reluctant to uh, tinker with it in a, in a statutory uh, fashion. If you took that out of the, uh, the legislation, would you be more inclined to support this kind of legislation? Uh, yes, I, I, I certainly would. I, as I said, that uh, we at CEQ in, endorse the, and heartily so, the underlying uh, principles of this legislation. Dr. Riordan, uh, do you want to comment on this? Well, I think to the extent, to the extent we can, uh, and here I'm speaking more from just uh, secondhand information, we attempt to bring considerations of biodiversity into our review activities under NEPA in our regions under, under NEPA and 309. We've always looked upon that as a fairly broad authority to do that. Some of the issues have to do with what is biodiversity and what are the tools that we have available in order to uh, interpret and apply uh, decisions or, 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 or help decisions relative to that goal. So I don't think we've looked upon it as an absence of authority. Dr. Buffington, do you have any comment on that? I, I think the characterization of, of the NEPA document as being equivalent to a, a constitutional framework is, is a, a very good analogy. I, I know uh, the, there seems to be a concern in the legal community that modifying NEPA will, in some fashion as yet unknown, uh, <coughs> great opportunities to, to make new law in the courts, and we don't know where that path may lead us. The existing law gives us the capability, and perhaps we are not utilizing the capability sufficiently, but NEPA is, is, uh, is quite capably uh, guarded by uh, CEQ, and, and uh, the Department of Interior would certainly defer to, uh, to CEQ on any NEPA-related uh, legislation issues. I uh, would like to go to the floor at this point, since I'm going to be participating in the debate. Uh, but could, could I ask you for the record to just submit uh, your uh, thoughts on the differences between our Bill 585-2082 uh, and, and um, uh, what you see the significant differences uh, are and, and how you compare the impacts of both bills? I'd be just no, no, nothing long-winded, but just uh, basic, uh, a few basic comments. I'd, I'd be too delighted to. Mr. Chairman, in, in uh, desire to get things moving along, I'm going to move along. So I yield back the balance of my time at this at this moment. I thank my colleague. I thank my colleague, and I'll be joining you on the floor very soon. Uh, Mr. Land, uh, let me ask you. Since you operate under NEPA, under the National Environmental Policy Act, and NEPA expressly uh, requires consideration of, uh, <clears throat> of impacts of government programs on biodiversity, why do you shy away from including a requirement that organizations that file an Environmental Impact Act should consider the impact of whatever action they're applying for, the impact on biodiversity. It's right in the law under which you function. What's wrong with making that an explicit <coughs> matter that their, environ that their, their uh, environmental impact statement should address? I, I agree. It's, it's right in the law, and it uh, clearly should be addressed. And it's the responsibility of CEQ to see that it's addressed. And I intend to uh, fulfill that responsibility, but I think I can do so under existing authorities without any additional uh, statutory assistance. Would you propose to put out a regulation saying that in drafting an environmental impact statement, the effect of that action, whatever is proposed, <clears throat> on biodiversity should be uh, faced up to in that environmental what, impact statement. What I would How would you require, because that's what needs to be done, the, the folks who are putting together an environmental impact statement to include the effect of that action 
on biodiversity. You're, you're right. And what I would no, 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 I'm asking propose, a question. what I would propose to do is to issue uh, guidance, as I indicated uh, earlier, uh, to the agencies uh, on the inclusion of biodiversity uh, in environmental impact uh, statements. The problem that I have with adding uh, an additional uh, uh, specific... Uh, Mr. DeLand, uh, NEPA has been around for two decades. How come that hasn't been done up to now? And how come that uh, institutions and corporations who file environmental impact statements do not address the question of the impact of the actions proposed on biodiversity. You've had a 20-year experience uh, with little or no concern being given to biodiversity when the actual environmental impact statements are filed. What's wrong with uh, all of us as a government putting our money where our mouth is and requiring them in clear un mis <coughs> not language not to be uh, misunderstood, that they must address the question of, of uh, biodiversity in the environmental impact statement. Well, I think it, as you're well aware, I, I know you're well aware, Mr. Chairman, that uh, biodiversity is just now a, an issue that has captured attention within the last uh, decade. And during that decade, uh, CEQ was at its all-time low and, quite frankly, did not uh, oversee NEPA to the degree that it, it should. I am very reluctant about adding... I'm going to have to suspend this hearing, unfortunately, because I've got to make a roll call vote. Right. Suspending the hearing for 15 minutes. Do you want the Helen to come back? Yes, if you'd please wait. <clears throat> we appreciate uh, Mr. DeLand's willingness to be hauled back here from, from the hall for a couple of minutes. Uh, we're grateful to you, Mr. DeLand. Would you repeat what you were saying about the inadequate job that the CEQ has been doing for the last 10 years. <laughs> That's one reason I wanted to leave. I thought you might pick up on that. <laughs> but uh, as that I... That caught my attention as I was leaving for that roll call vote. As you and I have discussed uh, previously that CEQ, in my judgment, did a commendable job uh, from the outset uh, under Russell Train's uh, guidance in the early days and continuing uh, through the Carter administration and then was allowed, uh, charitably speaking, to wither on the vine uh, during the course of the last administration. That is charitably speaking uh, indeed. President Bush is committed uh, to its resuscitation and is evidenced uh, by the fact that he, uh, two years running, has uh, requested a doubling of CEQ's uh, budget. I was not as artful as I should have been in obtaining the full funds last year from Congress, but we're clearly on the way back. The, the staff has uh, grown from the eight persons who were on scene when I arrived uh, in the summer of 89 up to uh, nearly 30, 30 now, and we're hoping to get back to the level of uh, 40, which was the nucleus uh, during the earlier days. Okay. Uh, let me make it clear beyond any question that we have enormous respect for you. You come here with great uh, credibility, uh, and uh, we hold you in very high esteem. But we hold some of your colleagues in uh, influential places in the administration also in high esteem, but we hold them in minimum high esteem. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there are some guys around the White House uh, who have uh, put the surgeon scalpel to many excellently conceived environment programs in the past. You're quite aware of that. Two surgeons that I can think of are Dr. Sununu and Dr. Darman. Uh, and apparently they've been supported by the president. And they have frequently frustrated the wishes of uh, Bill Riley, no question about that. They have frequently frustrated the wishes of uh, 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 Doctor, uh, of, uh, of Admiral Jim Watkins in very enlightened energy programs, balanced energy programs, including the concepts of conservation, including concepts of energy efficiency, including concepts of energy alternatives, that these two surgeons have trashed. Sometimes they substitute a meat axe for the scalpel. We don't know when, but we know they're ready to wield a lethal instrument on these excellently conceived programs. So giving you uh, full credit for the, for the excellence and the knowledge and the dedication that you bring to your job, and nobody, but nobody disputes that. Uh, why wouldn't it be better to 
eliminate any possibility of doubt and have people who file a, an environmental impact statement have them as a natural course of events without any uh, hoop de doo or hoopla just address the impact of the proposed action on biological diversity. Why shouldn't that be a perfectly predictable element that they would have to address once they commence the business of putting together an environmental impact statement? I think it should be, and I think it's authorized uh, by uh, NEPA, and what we at CEQ should do is to put out uh, guidance uh, to the various uh, agencies, setting forth precisely uh, how they, sh they should indeed do that. And you're going to make that a requirement, that they face up to the biological diversity implications of the actions they propose? It's, it's included within the, within the statute, and yes, it, in my judgment, it, it should be a requirement, but I think uh, implemented via uh, guidance uh, rather than by any amendment to the statute it, itself or by regulation. All right, look, uh, I'm not going to press you any further. I appreciate your willingness to say for this question. Uh, how long will it take before you get out such an implementing directive? That uh, depends in significant uh, degree as to how successful we are in dealing with the United States Congress as to our appropriation for uh, the forthcoming fiscal year. If indeed we get the monies requested, that it'll be the number one uh, item on on our agenda, and we will uh, see that we get the appropriate people to, to do it and do it uh, quickly. Does drawing up such a directive to the various agencies in Washington require a great deal of funds or a great deal of extra personnel, a simple directive? Not a great deal, but uh, our legal staff is just uh, strapped uh, as it, as strapped as it can possibly be at the moment. I will. Uh, talk to the general counsel and, and see if there isn't some way that we can uh, shoehorn this in in the intervening uh, months, but I, I don't want to promise something that I can't, can't deliver on. Well, we have a, a very small uh, legal staff at, at the moment and, and one that is engaged, as you well know, across the entire environmental spectrum. Yes, indeed. Well, look, to further uh, cooperation at every level between the executive branch and the legislative branch, may I offer you the, to, to the opportunity of taking full, uh, <coughs> full benefit from uh, the wisdom and the sagacity that inheres in our environmental council for this subcommittee, for this full committee, and indeed uh, the Environment Council of the Interior Committee. We would be happy to work with you informally in drafting a mutually acceptable directive to your agencies. I, I only say that half in facetiousness. We really would be happy to sit down and submit some drafts that you could then play with. I, I quite seriously appreciate that offer and I will, will seize upon it and, and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. We appreciated your testimony and uh, we very much appreciate your coming back for this few minutes. Th so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Uh, now, Mr. Buffington. <clears throat> uh, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which you represent, has authority and responsibility for preserving endangered species. Is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service capable of handling that job alone? The Endangered Species Act lays a requirement on all federal agencies. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, acts uh, uh, as the focal point, uh, just as, as uh, under NEPA, the CEQ uh, provides that focal point. And uh, there are mechanisms built into the law, such as consultation mechanisms, which require other federal agencies to come and consult with us and uh, uh, enables us to, uh, to, to deal with issues outside those that are immediately under our, our direct influence. Okay, now follow up for that. Do you view the Endangered Species Act as sufficient to solve the problems of declining biodiversity in this onrushing, uh, unbelievably rapid loss of biodiversity in this country? Has it proven an effective instrument to counter that trend? Well, those are really two questions, and the answers are yes and no. Uh, I think that the, fish, the uh, Endangered Species Act has been an extremely effective uh, act. It is viewed as an international model. I think that the, uh, the Congress and the administration through the years could take a great deal of pride, uh, both in the enactment of the legislation as amended through the years and uh, in the way it's been carried out. Are you speaking of the Endangered Species Act? Yes, I am, sir. Well, you know, there's a lot of intelligent people 
uh, in, in the environment community and even the business community who feel that <laughs> it hasn't been effective and that it's been disastrous because in focusing on uh, endangered species, by the time by the time you get through the three, four, five years it takes to get a species in danger, uh, declared to be endangered, it's gone. It's history. And that's happened time after time after time after time. And what we've learned is you really cannot preserve endangered species. It's almost an impossibility. Because in the time it takes, if, if the, uh, if the ecological environment in which that species exists continues to deteriorate, as night follows day, that species is gone. And uh, we've accumulated, I think, a, a, a deeper understanding of <clears throat> how endangered species disappear. And it leads us to the conclusion that you have to think of the endangered environment, the endangered ecosystem. And there are a lot of people who feel, and I think this committee feels, that uh, the principle of trying to preserve endangered species uh, through looking only at the species is flawed, is fundamentally flawed. As a matter of fact, we have characterized that law only half in joke as the pre-endangered species act. By the time they get to be endangered species, they're gone, they're history. And I don't know how you can sit there and tell us that we ought to take great pride in the way the Endangered Species Act has worked. I don't think it's worked well at all. I think it has been a comfortable framework in which we have seen thousands of species disappear without any help, without any safety net coming from the Endangered Species Act. Would you take uh, issue with that? Well, to go back several paragraphs uh, in, in the testimony here, as I said, uh, there were, you asked two questions, and the answers were yes and no. Uh, my first answer was the yes part. The second answer is the no part. Characterizing the Endangered Species Act as, as failing is like uh, saying that uh, uh, community public health systems don't work because uh, we have people showing up in emergency wards. Endangered Species Act is one piece of legislation that has carried out its goals, I think, admirably well, but is one piece of environmental legislation. The Clean Water Act, the Clean, Clean Air Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, all these acts individually and collectively contribute to the maintenance of biodiversity in this country. Yes, but Endangered what, Species Act is one tool, one act. What, what I'm saying is they have, but I don't think the Endangered Species Act has. And I don't think the GAO thinks they have because the language I used was substantially the language that the General Accounting Office has used about to characterize the uh, Endangered Species Act. It hasn't worked. On the contrary, Mr. Chairman, the GAO said that the Endangered Species Act was a very useful tool that was inadequately funded. And the Secretary has admitted this, the Director has admitted this, it's been publicly discussed in a number of national papers, that in fact that we, we do not have the resources to carry out the mandate completely. Uh, I don't think this is, a, this is a very much of a secret in the federal government. The act itself is sound. We, we think the act itself is uh, substantively flawed. Then I you guess we cannot, have a substantive disagreement. We certainly do. Now, we have asked the GAO to give us a report on this very important matter that you and I are discussing now, and it will be available later this year, and we would look forward to discussing it with you and asking you to come up and testify once both of us have had a chance to scrutinize the GAO report. Okay? Yes, sir. We're under, operating under a very strict uh, time constraints this morning, so I want to thank this panel very much for their fine testimony, and uh, we'll move to uh, panel three. Uh, Dr. James McChesney, Mr. David Ford, and Ms. Connie Lewis. I have to go down there at 12.30. 12.45. 12.45. David's going to come get me. Oh, all right. I'm going to watch the time for you and keep putting this in Okay. <clears throat> I'm delighted that we've been joined by <clears throat> Congresswoman Connie Morella of the state of Maryland. Oh, Welcome, you. Connie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm um, also pleased to be here at this uh, hearing, listen to our distinguished witnesses, and I am a co-sponsor of the bill, as yes, you indeed. know. Connie, and I, do, you, 
Do you have a statement that I you'd have a like statement for the record, and I'm ready to go on with the, uh, right. the panel. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. Uh, we, we will adhere to a five-minute uh, time restraint because we're under very severe pressure this morning. Uh, your full statements will be uh, printed in full at the time at which you testify. Okay? Uh, so let's hear first from Dr. James McChesney, Director of Research, Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, uh, testifying on behalf of the American Pharmaceutical Association and the American Society of Pharmacognosy. Pharmacognosy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you tell us what pharmacognosy is in the very, very briefly? Pharmacognosy, by literal definition, is knowledge about drugs. Yes. And uh, we take that name from the point of view of natural drugs, particularly. Good. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> biological diversity is a name we give to the occurrence of the many different kinds of organisms found in the world. I would emphasize that it is important to recognize that biological diversity is an outward evidence of chemical diversity. All organisms interact with other organisms and their environment by chemical means. Plants, organisms which are fixed in place and cannot flee injury, have evolved chemical defenses to protect themselves. Many insects find mates by releasing attractant chemicals into the environment to allure mates. Prey and predators interact through chemical scents as well as sight. Even humankind's exploitation of organisms is based largely upon our utilization of specific chemicals produced by those organisms. All our foods are in reality chemicals, as are our natural fibers and all of our medicines. Historically, humankind has derived our medications from natural sources, that is, chemicals found in various organisms. That situation continues today. Nearly every drug class was first discovered based upon a natural product chemical. Everyone would agree that the antibiotics, chemicals produced by microorganisms in their competition for space in the microbial world, have revolutionized modern medicine. However, we lack specific curative agents for a number of important diseases. In the United States, heart disease, cancer, viral diseases such as AIDS, antibiotic-resistant infections, and many others still lack adequate treatment. Evaluation of chemicals found in or produced by different kinds of organisms is one of our most productive sources of new drugs with which to treat these presently untreatable diseases. Let me give you a specific example of the importance of retaining biological diversity in relation to discovery of new drugs. As we've heard this morning, in the Pacific Northwest, we still have areas of so-called old-growth forest. These areas, these are areas where a diversity of trees grow, some of which are very valuable timber sources, and some of which have been previously viewed as weeds, that is, of little, little or no commercial value. As such areas are harvested for timber, the weed trees are usually removed and disposed of in the practice of clear cutting. Then the clear cut areas are replanted to monoculture with commercially valuable timber trees such as Douglas fir. As it turns out, the National Cancer Institute has discovered that one of these weed tree <coughs> species, the western yew, or Taxus brevifolia, contains a chemical called Taxol, which is showing very great promise in the treatment of cancer. My point, here is an apparently useless tree, which would have likely become extinct due to our present forestry practices, which replace diverse old growth forests with planted commercially valuable species, but which in fact, this useless tree produces a chemical, Taxol, which will help treat cancer. This important new class of anti-cancer agents represented by Taxol would have been lost to us forever in a few, year, few more years of normal forestry practices. This is just one of many examples I might cite. Others will likely provide more information on new chemicals for use in agriculture, but let me mention that as we learn more about and understand better how diverse organisms interact chemically, we will undoubtedly discover natural chemicals which will control plant growth and insect behaviors so that presently toxic and environmentally impacting pesticides can be replaced by substances which protect our crops more selectively and more safely. However, unless we act now to assure conservation of biological diversity and its attendant chemical diversity, the treasure trove of natural products substances for use in medicine and agriculture will be lost to humankind forever. Clearly, the proposed acts will provide a vehicle to bring about conservation of biological diversity. I speak in support of their passage. 
In addition to my remarks here, I have a short written statement, which I hope can be included in the record of this hearing as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There being no objection, so ordered, and we appreciate your testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Mr. David Ford, Vice President, Public Timber of the National Forest Products Association. Please proceed. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is David Ford. I'm here representing the American Forest Council as well as National Forest Products Association and the American Forest Resource Alliance. We too share a fundamental concern over the reduction of diversity, not only in our nation, but also uh, throughout the world. A strategy to protect, to respect, or enhance biodiversity must recognize the role of humans in the biosphere. An acceptable strategy must not require the separation of people from other species or the isolation of man from nature. Humans are part of the global ecosystem, and their presence and influence in all likelihood will increase rather than diminish in the future. Humans must be part of the solution. Effective conservation of diversity does not mean simply withdrawing lands for multiple use management and attempting to prevent all change. Set aside such as wilderness special management areas, buffer zones, and greenways do not necessarily translate into gains in biodiversity and in fact may contribute, uh, may be a contributing factor to its decline by increasing the type and number of competing uses on a smaller land base. We believe the challenge before us requires the integration of biodiversity and human use of public and private lands. Section 8 of H.R. 2082 calls for the establishing a program of grants uh, to the heritage uh, programs. The forest products industry has long been supportive of stage heritage programs. However, we believe federal dollars are better spent on existing federal agency inventory programs, such as the Forest Service Inventory and Analysis Program that uh, has been operating for a number of years. Section 9 of H.R. 2082, we understand, is designed uh, to provide federal protection of natural communities identified by gap analysis, although this analysis technique does have promise as a tool to identify natural communities which are native in the United States. We do not support using it to identify lands for the purposes of increasing federal land ownership. We hope Congress recognizes that it will likely never be able to purchase representative examples of all natural communities existing in the United States. A more realistic approach is to recognize that private lands maintained in private ownership are a key to maintaining diversity in the United States. All levels of government should work with the private sector to develop alternatives to increase federal land, uh, alternatives to increase in federal land ownership, such as incentives to private lands, uh, landowners who do manage to promote diversity. <clears throat> As you've heard this morning, uh, there are a number of uh, federal laws already in existence, uh, and they're outlined, uh, I think, well in the uh, 1987 Office of Technology uh, Assessment Report on Diversity, the Endangered Species Act, and the many laws and programs which provide uh, means to enhance biodiversity are not, uh, are not implemented to the extent possible because they do lack funding. Congress must identify conservation of biodiversity as a national priority first by funding programs which are currently in place. Diversity is more than a concept, uh, is more a concept rather than a discrete uh, quantifiable resource. Man mandating public agencies to quantify conservation of diversity will most assuredly lead to litigation in our view. Judges will then be forced to set arbitrary standards and definitions which are more appropriately determined by professionals uh, on the ground uh, through direct public involvement. Conservation of diversity should be a reason for enforcement and funding of existing environmental le legislation, nation nationwide forest and range inventories, and for full implementation of national forest land management plans. Federal agencies each uh, have uh, the necessary legislative tools uh, in place to be successful in conserving diversity. A coordinated national effort would be appropriate. However, legislation, in our view, is not necessary for, fer for federal agencies to coordinate with each other or with the private sector. There are many examples of where coordination among federal, state, and local governments, as well as the private sector, have resulted in positive benefits in terms of maintaining diversity. We support better efforts uh, to define diversity uh, and uh, in ways to, uh, uh, to add to policy direction to assure that conservation of diversity uh, is consistent with our existing national priorities. We do not support either of the bills uh, before uh, that, that are being discussed today because they would mandate the protection of uh, an unquantifiable resource. Further, we object to the bill's proposed amendment to NEPA, uh, and uh, we believe that uh, finally these bills do not address some of the major issues which uh, 
would substantially enhance conservation diversity, such as providing a solution to inadequate funding of existing legislation uh, and focusing on, the, on a broader problem and uh, looking at it from a broader context of developing nations. In closing, in order to improve the conservation of diversity, we suggest Congress pursue the following. One, help provide federal agencies the resources that they require to uh, implement existing laws and programs. Two, promote demonstrations applicable to goals of developing nations, such as environmentally sound harvesting projects on the Caribbean National Forest. Three, increase domestic awareness through educational programs. Four, support international dialogues to, pr to promote uh, global conservation. And five, encourage research on biodiversity by supporting programs such as the Forest Service Research. One last note, if I may, uh, President, Bush, uh, President Bush announced this week that he created an awards program. Uh, the Environment and Conservation Challenge Awards uh, that he believes will stimulate voluntary activity and recognize people and groups whose activities best exemplify cooperation and innovation in developing econom economically productive solutions to our nation's environmental uh, challenges. We believe this is a positive and productive way to set examples for others in our country and those around the world. Uh, we believe that through human innovation we can forward solutions to meet uh, our environmental challenges. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford. And now we'll hear from Connie Lewis, Thank you. Senior Associate of the Keystone Center in Keystone, Colorado. Please proceed. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Keystone Center, on behalf of the Keystone Center, I'm very pleased to be able to testify. The Keystone Center is a neutral, nonprofit organization which facilitates the resolution of national public policy conflicts through the use of a consensus dialogue approach especially on issues related to natural resources and the environment. As a, as a neutral conflict resolution organization, the Keystone Center does not take substantive positions on the issue, issues in which we are in, involved. As you are probably aware, the Keystone Center's involvement with biodiversity is multifaceted. We convened and facilitated the recently completed National Policy Dialogue on Biological Diversity on Federal Lands. The center is designing and will be facilitating the North American Consultation on the World Biodiversity Conservation Strategy, which is being developed by the United Nations Environment Program, World Resources Institute, and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Another important related activity is the Keystone International Policy Dialogue Series on Plant Genetic Resources. The Keystone Center was asked to convene the dialogue on biodiversity on federal lands by several of the agencies and groups with an interest in the use and conservation of biodiversity. The intent was to bring together a diverse cross-section of the agencies and groups with an interest and stake in biodiversity conservation to try to develop consensus recommendations. The center's role was to facilitate the process and produce a final report outlining the group's deliberations. We worked closely with an advisory committee to develop the dialogue agenda and to identify participants for inclusion in the process. The committee suggested and the dialogue group agreed at the outset that to bring additional clarity to the discussions, the focus of the dialogue should be on federal lands. Participants for the dialogue were drawn from federal agencies, including the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Defense, Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, USDA Forest Service, and the National Park Service, national environmental organizations, commodity groups including mining, oil and gas, timber, and grazing, congressional committee staffs, and the scientific community. It should be noted that all participants attended as individuals, not as formal representatives of their respective organizations or agencies. The dialogue enabled this extremely diverse group of participants from across the spectrum of perspectives on biodiversity to identify many points upon which they agreed, as well as to clarify major points of, of disagreement. The 65 or so participants worked for approximately a year and a half to develop a package of recommendations focusing on national policy goals and objectives and strategies to accomplish those goals. The group's recommendations encompassed interagency coordination, genetic species, community, and ecosystem level conservation efforts, agency planning procedures, inventory, monitoring, research, and data collection, the integration of human activities with biodiversity conservation, involvement of the private sector, and training and education. The amount of con consensus achieved 
by the group was notable, I think, in light of the controversy surrounding biodiversity. They identified and agreed on strengths and weaknesses of existing programs, broad brush policy goals and objectives, an approach for recognizing when biodiversity goals are being achieved and detailed management strategies. Having spent the last two years of my life in the middle of the biodiversity arena, so to speak, I very much appreciate the task in front of the committee to try to formulate a bill that responds to the differences of opinion that remain on this complex topic. I hope you find the Keystone Center dialogue reports and the insights gained in the process useful as you approach that task. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lewis. Uh, my colleague, Congresswoman Morella of the State of Maryland. Thank you. I would like to uh, have the opportunity, in the interest of time, of submit some questions, maybe for the record, but maybe if I could just also just now ask one general question. Yes, there are many laws that we already have on the books. I don't know whether 28 or whatever the number is. Would it not be more beneficial to work them all into one? Would that not be easier to then implement and follow through on? I guess Dr. McChesney and Mr. Ford particularly, and if Ms. Lewis would like to comment on it, just seems to me in the interest of efficiency, instead of saying, no, we don't like any of the other legislation, if it could pull it all into one. If I may respond with a, in a sense of personal uh, opinion here, uh, the issues that were raised earlier in discussion this morning about needing a centralized coordination and uh, focus point uh, as defined particularly by the Center for uh, Study and Conservation of Biological Diversity, uh, I think is a, is a key element of the present uh, legislation under uh, consideration. Uh, it is, in fact, the fragmentary nature of all of the existing uh, law uh, and the uh, occasional apparent conflicts, et cetera, which uh, I think are leading to some of the problems we face. Uh, the issue of moving on quickly, uh, you know, time, uh, to use a cliche, is, is of the essence. Uh, these species are disappearing while we dally. Uh, to bring that focus together as proposed in 585, I think, is very important. Thank you. Mr. Point. Well, I don't think it's a question of, uh, of an either-or situation. Uh, this, this law, if it was enacted, either one of these laws wouldn't uh, supplant the other provisions that already exist in law. And uh, it seems to us that uh, we have a lot of programs out there that, uh, that aren't being currently funded. The Endangered Species Act is a good example, and uh, that's only one piece of the puzzle. And it's uh, our view at this time that, that rather than continuing to uh, add to the legislative body that we ought to we ought to fund and make programs that are uh, in existence better and uh, workable, and that ought to be our, our direction. I would just note that the issue of whether or not legislation should be, new legislation should be proposed was one on which our dialogue group split. There was not a consensus recommendation coming out of the group on whether or not to recommend either for or against new legislation. My, my point in bringing it up was conceptually, would it not be better to bring it all together and then try for the funding? I realize the difficulty of the funding. Uh -huh. Conceptually, uh, the, the notion of trying to bring together uh, all, these, all these various laws sounds very good conceptually, but reality uh, is uh, I think it, that this bill, the way it's drafted at this point, doesn't, doesn't uh, reach that that uh, if that's the direction that you're trying to head on this bill, it doesn't seem to me that, that you're reaching that, that, uh, that conclusion with this piece of legislation. If that's your intent. I guess in my view, perhaps the most important thing that we will leave to future generations is the biological diversity represented in our ecosphere, in our biosphere. Uh, as that continually degrades, uh, that heritage is lost to our children, our grandchildren, and their children. Uh, we must bring about effective and efficient ways to guard that heritage. And I think this law begins to move in that direction. It perhaps doesn't have all of the elements we need, but it certainly is an improvement, I think, on existing conditions. And I speak in its support. Thank you. I think your um, responses have all been very provocative and very, very informative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, my colleague. Uh, Dr. McChesney, <clears throat> following up on your remarks, if we regard only endangered species, if we perceive only endangered species and not their environments, not their communities, and not endangered ecosystems, 
as the issue that we address, will that uh, concentration of our minds and our laws on the endangered species be sufficient to protect the, genetical mater the genetic material necessary uh, for the development of new pharmaceuticals by your industry? We do not believe that that would be the case. In point of fact, uh, endangered species are in very large measure uh, set aside from evaluation and investigation for uh, as sources of new drugs, uh, primarily from a recognition that they will not uh, provide a sustainable long-term uh, uh, supply, for example. Uh, consequently, their interaction in the environment and the protection of the uh, total uh, ecosystem in which they uh, occur is uh, very important to the overall process of drug discovery. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Lewis, D during your uh, consensus uh, reaching effort, uh, was it possible to incorporate all of the concerns that were expressed in a, 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 a consensus statement? Or were there some views that simply couldn't be reconciled with the majority, some minority views that couldn't be reconciled with the majority? And if so, why? Um, as with most Keystone Dialogues, it was not expected from the outset that there would be a reconciliation of all disparate points of view. And no, there, we were not able to incorporate or reconcile all interests that were present in the room. There were a couple of discrete points upon which the group agreed to disagree and that those disagreements are articulated in the document. Um, one was on this, the issue of legislation, which I previously alluded to. The second was on the issue of whether or not to recommend um, new land designation and acquisition programs. Um, there was also an inability on the part of some of the dialogue participants to um, sign on to or to agree to support the whole package of recommendations after it was concluded. And there were a variety of reasons for, um, for that to occur. Um, in the case of some of the participants who did not sign on to the package, um, and it, it, I think it was an indication of the volatility of the issue, that even though they were there as dialogue participants, they felt um, it was necessary to um, go to the association from which um, they were representative and to request their support in their agreement before signing on to the document. And our experience it has often been that it's difficult to bring people aboard who have not been part of the process all along. And um, that, was the, that was certainly the case in this instance. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Lewis. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ford, you were part of the process. That's correct. All of that time. You were brought aboard and you did uh, participate for a year or more in those uh, conversations, those consensus, those efforts to achieve consensus. But at the end of the hunt, uh, on the bottom line, uh, you weren't able to sign that final report. That, can, that's correct. Can you tell us why? Well, I think as Connie articulated, uh, the, the, I, I think when you evaluate uh, that whole process, it was a very productive process that we participated in. And uh, it was educational from a standpoint of the forest products industry, who I represent, to begin to understand the views. Not educational enough. <laughs> well, being educational and, and reaching uh, consensus and agreement may be two different things. And, and as Connie indicated, in my particular case, I represent uh, a national association of uh, literally a thousand or more companies across the U.S. that have a variety of views, and trying to reach consensus amongst that group uh, is, is quite difficult. And, is uh, this a question of sort of the lowest common denominator governing your decision-making process? No, it's a matter of, of reaching consensus, and, uh, and uh, just as you do work here in your committee, consensus uh, be generally is reached as, as you move forward on things. And uh, I guess I can tell you that uh, it was a productive exercise. We've all learned a lot about it. Uh, we've had Keystone, as an example, come into our executive committees and discuss this process and, and raise the conscious level of, of these type of issues to our industry. <coughs> and as, I, as I've indicated to you uh, 
in previous testimony, uh, it is certainly our interest to, uh, to move forward uh, on uh, maintaining a diverse ecosystem because that's, uh, the, that's the foundation of the livelihood of our business and that's maintaining a timber crop for the future. Yes, but when the chips were down, although there was a broadly reached consensus, and after your participation for several years, you weren't able to join that consensus. Well, I, I did not sign the document, and I was not the only one that did not sign that document. Uh, there were uh, members of the, uh, if you will, the uh, environmental community also that were not uh, able to sign that document, for example. process. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford, and thank you for this panel. It was a very productive and helpful panel. We thank you. And now we'll move to the last panel. Dr. Patricia Bratt, Dr. Michael Bean, and Ms. Laurie McDonald. All right. <clears throat> we are operating, again, I remind you, on a very strict timetable. I must be out of here in 20 minutes. So I'm going to ask you all to sum up your testimony in four minutes, if I may. Of course, your testimony will be reprinted in full at the point in the uh, schedule where you testify. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say especially to Dr. Patricia Bratt, uh, uh, our ranking uh, minority member from Pennsylvania, Don, Don Ritter, asked me to express his a special uh, welcome to you. You're apparently old friends regard each other very highly. Don Ritter is a key supporter of the uh, uh, legislation that we're considering on the floor now having to do with fast track. He's a supporter of fast track. I have to go over in 20 minutes to oppose him and make a speech on the floor in opposition. So while we generally work together in this committee very cooperatively and productively, we're on the other side. We're on both sides of the fence on fast track, which proves absolutely nothing. So, we welcome you all. Uh, why don't we ask you first uh, to give us your uh, four or five minutes, and uh, after Mr. Bean and Ms. McDonald have testified, I'll have a few questions for you. Please proceed, Ms. Bratt. Thank you. I thought I was going to say good morning, but it's now good afternoon. It's right. a pleasure to be here and to share with you my concerns about biodiversity. My field is aquatic ecology. My research is focused primarily on eastern Pennsylvania. For the past 11 years, I have been studying the effects of lake acidification and lake neutralization in the Pocono Mountains. This spring, I'm studying at Cornell University, working with invertebrates in the Adirondack <coughs> Mountains. As a biologist, I concur totally and enthusiastically with the findings in H.R. 585, and I commend your committee for this pioneering legislation. Biodiversity has been a focus of my research on lake acidification and neutralization. And over the past 11 years, we have documented lower biodiversity among algae, aquatic plants, and fish in acid lakes. Data from the Adirondacks reinforce these conclusions. I am studying a small corner of the world, and I have spent many long hours in the field. I have seen the damage and documented that acidification decreases aquatic biodiversity. I am extremely concerned. We have seen that the application of limestone to neutralize lake acidity can result in significant increases in biodiversity of aquatic invertebrates. We hope that other methods of re reversing trends toward decreasing biodiversity can be addressed, and such of this is mentioned in, uh, in the bill. Another stress to which aquatic ecosystems are subjected is eutrophication, too many plant nutrients in the water. Many of our lakes and streams, estuaries, for example, Ches Chesapeake Bay, the Florida Everglades and the New Jersey Pinelands are becoming culturally eutrophied, a result of human activities. As these aquatic ecosystems are stressed by eutrophication or acidification, numbers of sensitive species may decrease dramatically or disappear altogether. The species, the sensitive species cannot compete with the tough pollution intolerant forms. These stresses cause biological communities to change, species are lost, a cascade of extinction occurs, nutrient pathways are altered, and ecosystem functioning may be irrevocably damaged. David Schindler of the Canadian Freshwater Institute fears that 40 to 70 percent of acid-sensitive invertebrates and algae and many fish have already disappeared from lakes in both the Poconos and the Adirondacks. And I cite scientific uh, papers by Dr. Schindler. How can H.R. 585 help 
biodiversity research by scientists such as myself. For the past 20 years, I have studied benthic invertebrates, critters that live on the bottom of lakes and streams. I've looked at a lot of mud. It is essential for evaluating the health of an aquatic ecosystem to know exactly how many different kinds of invertebrates and algae there are. However, invertebrate identifications are very difficult, in sore need of research, and taxonomic keys are often unpublished or inaccessible. I must send fingernail clams to Canada, midge larvae to Pittsburgh, snails to Philadelphia, and mayflies to Illinois for identification. We desperately need the National Center for Biological Diversity at the Smithsonian, where all such taxonomic data may be consolidated. The center would set research priorities on biodiversity, such as those recently proposed by the Ecological Society of America. That reference is also provided. The center would also encourage cooperation among the scientific, conservation, and public policy communities and develop plans for educating the American public. Invertebrates account for 90% of the animal biomass on Earth, 95% of all animal species, and are the most diverse group on Earth. Yet so very few have been identified. That's cited in the National Science Board. Not only is this true for the tropics, but we are also losing valuable invertebrate species in the temperate regions, such as I have mentioned. We do not even know what we are losing because they have not yet been cataloged. In Pennsylvania, for example, only butterflies, dragonflies, and mussels have been inventoried. We know little to nothing about the strains of, and uh, status of myriads of other invertebrate species, algae, fungi, fungi, and microorganisms. Species may disappear, and we may never know they were even there. We need a national biological inventory to discover the many small, inconspicuous critters that may be vital to ecosystem functioning. In summary, biodiversity is not just warm, fuzzy invertebrates, beautiful birds, and spectacular flowers. These are the more visible organisms. But of perhaps greater importance to ecosystem functioning are the little-known beetles that bury dead carcasses, the praying mantis that bites off its mate's head, the hat-throwing fungus that tosses its spores a meter, the delicious mushroom that grows only in symbiotic association with certain trees, and the alga that spends its winters in the gut of a dragonfly. As a biologist, I am continually surprised and delighted by the diversity of forms and functions that living organisms assume. They have evolved to take advantage of a particular ecological niche, and we must preserve these niches lest we destroy inconspicuous <coughs> species forever before we ever know why they are on the planet. We must preserve all those weird and wonderful creatures. I heartily endorse HB 585. Wish you the best possible uh, luck in obtaining passage through Congress. We need thank the legislation. Thank, thank you. you very much, Dr. Bratt. And now, Laurie McDonald, your four to five minutes, maximum five minutes. Um, thank you very much. I would like Microphone, to. Microphone, please. Okay. Sit on now. Laura McDonald, Chairwoman of the Biodiversity Committee of the Sierra Club. Yes. Please proceed. I thank you very much for this opportunity to be here and to speak about biodiversity and the opportunity to thank you for the work that you've done. Um, as a citizen activist and as a wildlife zoologist, um, the issues involved with biodiversity are at the core of both my volunteer and my professional work. Um, so I'm very proud to be here for the Sierra Club, which um, is a grassroots environmental organization of over 650,000 members and is now approaching its 100th year of environmental advocacy. The last 100 years have seen the establishment of America's great national parks, wilderness areas, refuges, and other public land uh, protection programs, both through federal agencies and through state and local government. Um, you're well aware also that over these years, the, uh, these lands have become fragmented units, fragmented geographically, uh, in terms of management and in terms of purpose. Uh, many people have talked to you already about the results of, of this on and the loss of our biodiversity. So what I would like to concentrate on is to tell you more about the grassroots support and need um, for biodiversity legislation and a few words about the bills themselves. Um, your bill is a very good bill. You have recognized um, a problem. You have stated a purpose, how to take uh, what the uh, mission is uh, because of that problem. You are saying, let's put together a strategic plan you're giving the tools for carrying the strategic plan out, and then there is a monitoring function in order to see that it's implemented. I find that a very good way of going about solving a problem. The, um, 
It will help us at many levels. The Sierra Club and many other environmental organizations, individuals and so forth, work at state level, local level, regional and federal level on these types of issues. State level, um, several of us are advancing biodiversity bills in large part based on, on your model um, in our own state legislatures and in case you had not heard this yet, um, in Michigan, the, their House of Representatives has passed a biodiversity bill. It passed by a vote of 100 to 0 and we look for the passage in their, in their Senate. Um, on the local uh, level, we have um, groups who are uh, working with their with land use programs, um, working through um, our Sierra Club's political committees to put people into office who will support better um, uh, wildlife protection. Um, we are doing sometimes our own research and mapping and we need help. We need help in working throughout these problems. On the regional efforts, look at our greater Yellowstone area and the myriad of problems there, um, the fact that different agencies are going in different directions and working at cross purposes and we need to bring people together to communicate and to put together better plans, comprehensive plans. As you know, Sierra Club's worked on federal legislation. Um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, California Desert. We've worked for reauthorization and strengthening the Endangered Species Act, which of course is a major component of biodiversity legislation. What you do, what you do is give us a standard, you give us an expectation of responsible action and momentum to all of these efforts at all different levels. The, um, um, my testimony speaks about uh, H.R. 585 and some about also 2082 and, and you can see what we have to say about the, um, the good points, a very fine framework that's been set up. Um, something I would like to add is that we feel that one of the most critical aspects of a comprehensive solution is a good monitoring feedback system, also an international provision we feel should be added. So finally, I have one last statement to make and that's that when we look at endangered species, we put together a recovery program that involves various agencies and interests. They communicate, they put together a plan. When we, even in the new habitat conservation plans, you bring together the, the responsible agencies and interests and you put together a plan. Why is this not necessary when we're talking about the entire flora and fauna of our nation? Thank you. To ask the question, to ask the question is to answer it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Michael Bean, Director of the Wildlife Program for the Environmental Defense Fund, representing a coalition of environmental organizations. Please proceed, Mr. Bean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of the eight organizations identified in my written statement, I'd like to make just uh, four short points. The first point is that we support your bill and uh, would like to work with you to uh, uh, ensure its enactment into law. The second point is that a number of federal agency witnesses both today before you and yesterday before Mr. Studs and his subcommittee uh, contended that existing authorities to deal with this problem are adequate. No new authority is needed. Uh, I think, uh, sir, that it is simply not uh, tenable to acknowledge on the one hand that there is a serious problem of the dimension that Drs. Lovejoy and Raven and others have described while at the same time maintaining that existing authorities are adequate. Either existing authority is inadequate or it's being inadequately uh, implemented or it's being inadequately funded. Uh, you cannot reconcile the existence of this problem with adequate authority. I think what is needed is some sort of catalyst to um, uh, provide new authority and new impetus to address this problem and I think your bill provides that catalyst. Uh, on the subject of authorities, uh, I would refer you in particular to Appendix C of the Keystone Report. You will find in that appendix the rather extraordinary gap that exists between what agencies have the authority to do and what they are in fact doing. Some of that is summarized in my written statement, but what you will find is there is an enormous gap uh, and uh, it is the fact of that gap that accounts in large part for the problem we have today. The third point has to do with the center that uh, your bill would um, establish. Um, Dr. Buffington today and, and yesterday, his boss, uh, Director Turner of the Fish and Wildlife Service, both uh, referred to the possibility of establishing a center without walls. Uh, I frankly am concerned, sir, that the administration's position is that uh, there should be a center with neither walls nor foundation. Uh, I think it's important that, uh, uh, that there be a foundation and that and your bill, I think, provides uh, a foundation for a new initiative on biological diversity. 
Uh, the last point, sir, concerns funding. Um, given the magnitude of this problem, as other witnesses have described, given our experience with the Endangered Species Act, and I certainly share your frustration with the um, uh, low level of accomplishments under that act, I think the one lesson that we have learned uh, very clearly is that we cannot make a serious dent in this problem unless we provide resources that are commensurate with the size of the problem. The $10 million appropriation um, that your bill would authorize is, is a good first start, but it's only that, sir. It's, it's um, I think, only $2 million than the cost of a planned parade in this town in a few weeks. Um, it's a very small start, admittedly, but hopefully we'll work incrementally to build it up as experience proves that we're going down the right track. Yes, sir. I hope that will be the case because uh, I know that you are sincere and I hope other members of Congress are sincere as, as well in wanting to address this problem. And uh, uh, if they are, I think the uh, way to demonstrate that is to provide the resources to make this program and some of the other programs currently in effect, like the Endangered Species Act, uh, better funded and better capable of achieving their goals. Uh, that's a quick summary, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. Thank you all for your really very splendid, encouraging testimony. I'm going to ask just one question. You can each answer it very briefly, because I've got to be out of here in five minutes. <clears throat> and then we'll have some follow-up by mail. Uh, it's been argued that Section 5 of the Endangered Species Act, which directs the Secretary, Secretaries of Interior, Interior and Agriculture to establish and implement a program to conserve fish, wildlife, and plant species has never really been implemented and therefore has fallen far short of the mark. Do you feel that the coordinated federal strategy as envisaged in this legislation could accomplish the tasks that have not, I repeat, have not been accomplished up to now in the, under, the, uh, under the umbrella of the Endangered Species Act? I'll be happy to offer a, a thought on that. I think, yes, your legislation could uh, do exactly that. Uh, it is certainly correct that uh, the provisions of Section 5 have been uh, overlooked or not implemented to date, and uh, there seems to be little inclination on the part of the Fish and Wildlife Service to, uh, uh, to do so at this time. Uh, it does seem to me that your bill provides uh, the impetus uh, to take that mandate seriously and to uh, try to accomplish its objective. Anybody else? Yes. Um, the Endangered Species Act should be an affirmative act. There should be positive action taken, and it, and it hasn't been. The um, biodiversity bill that you have um, developed is such a, um, would take such action. I think that your bill could do this. What it does require is follow-up. It needs to be sure um, that there are provisions in it that show that there will be reporting back and implementation, good implementation. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, add right. my... Um, my two cents here in that is that I'm not sure that uh, the Endangered Species Act is really concerned about anything in the invertebrate or the mi microbial community except for butterflies and clams, and I think that's, that's very sad. There are many other things out there that we hardly even know anything about. Thank you very much. This was a fine panel, the wind-up panel of this set of hearings this morning. I thank you all. The hearing is suspended at the call of the chair. If you would like additional information about this subject, you can contact the sponsor, the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee at 2320 of the Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. Coming up next here on C-SPAN 2, an address by Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. The C-SPAN 2 schedule is available to viewers 24 hours a day.
For the latest information about our programming, dial 202-628-2205.